Welcome to Early U.S. Foreign Policy. This is Melinda Cole Klein. As European nations scrambled for new territories in Asia and Africa, Americans worried about being left behind. International trade encouraged the spread of commerce, Christianity, and civilization to non-Western peoples. This process led to healthier local populations because Western doctors brought medicine and knowledge. Engineers designed and constructed bridges, dams, and harbors for shipping. These policies applied by Western nations to non-industrial nations benefited industrial West as much as it did the local populations and their governments. This led to more people employed and higher standards of living. Keep in mind the businesses in Europe and the United States hungered for tropical raw materials. This commercial dependency contributed to a boom in international trade goods. The new imperialists were not traditional conquerors or empire builders like the Spanish conquistadors. Their aim was to extend their power over new territories and peoples, but also to control both the natural world and the indigenous societies more efficiently than had been done in the past. Their three objectives became the following. Number one, taming the wilderness. Number two, opening new international markets for manufactured goods to be sold. And number three, shortening time spent shipping with new technologies and solutions. The Industrial Revolution expanded demands for tropical crops and raw materials. During the 19th century, tea, coffee, and chocolate saw dramatic increases in European and American sales. Consumer goods from tropical regions were popular and in demand. All the while with trade came the influx of new ideas and technology brought about with engineering projects. In Latin America, new harbors built by American business interests for reason of trade made the transportation of coffee beans to harbor warehouses easier. A consumer-based economy supports the growth and advance of the following three. Number one, communication. Number two, technology. And number three, advances in Western-styled medicine. To support trade and commerce worldwide, ensuring safety and time-saving devices were targeted. Thus, to meet the industrial raw material needs of the U.S. and European nations, indirect or direct rule of non-Western peoples continued in tropical areas of interest, such as the Pacific Islands, parts of Africa, Asia, or in Latin America. Where rule was off the table, foreign dependency on U.S. loans created economic ties. Wild rainforests provided abundant resources of raw materials. The chinchona bark, which Europeans processed into quinine, medicine that offered resistance to malaria. Luxury items that would be made out of ivory, animal skins and furs, along with diamonds. Hardwoods would be made into fine furniture, flooring, and wall paneling. Mined ores such as copper necessary for the manufacture of wiring and cables in the need for telegraph, electric, and later telephone lines. These were, of course, mining resources as mentioned. 
One of the most important rainforest raw materials in demand by industrial nations was natural rubber. Natural rubber came from India, Central America, and African colonies such as the Congo. Rubber comes from tropical trees similar to the extraction of maple syrup. The milk syrup, like substance, is drained from trees. Rubber is one of the elements within the salty tree sap found in some plants, including the rubber fig. Once processed, this stretchy polymer can be made into many commercial products. Early inventions using rubber farmed from tropical trees included the English Wellington boot or gum boots. Proving to be waterproof and superior to leather boots when the weather or conditions were rather poor. The aristocrat, the Duke of Wellington, Arthur Wellesley, popularized the boot after a design constructed by his bootmaker. His name became associated with this boot from the 1810s. By the 1840s, this rubber boot was a regular item of apparel for British men and known worldwide. The Macintosh of 1824 was associated with a Scotsman, Charles Macintosh, who this fashion that would commence would be a rubber raincoat. Michelin invented an inflatable tire by the 1830s and 1840s. This rubber tire enabled bicycle and, in time, automobile manufacturers to use. While European inventors by the 1870s had come up with a synthetic rubber compound, it was very expensive to make. Thus, the high demand for manufacturers for natural rubber continued until the 1940s, when DuPont perfected. Demand for rubber by Europeans and Americans and their companies led to some interesting solutions. It is said Henry Ford had his own rubber tree farms in Brazil, ensuring he would have rubber for his automobiles. By the 1890s, the U.S. had a fast-growing population and industries that produced more manufactured goods than they could sell at home. U.S. merchants and bankers encouraged expanding overseas. A very important and influential book at the time in bringing the U.S. onto the world stage was by Alfred T. Mahan. This is remembered as the publication, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660 through 1783, and also The Influence of Sea Power Upon the French Revolution and Empire, 1793 through 1812. These books respectively were published in 1890 and 1892. Mahan argued, and rightly so, to be great and independent world power, such as the British or the French, depending on the time period, was to have a strong navy. History bears this out. Mahan, a former admiral, now retired, his argument supported with substantial evidence it fit into the American Manifest Destiny philosophy, urging territorial expansion for the good of the free world, a remnant of Massachusetts Puritanism to create a city upon a hill for the entire world to model, an 18th century American characteristic. Across his books, Mahan convincingly showed how having a navy was key to world power while securing domestic security. The Mexican Revolution was an armed revolt led by bands of Mexican peasants 
from 1910 to 1921. The peasantry drew arms in effort to end the rule of Porfirio Diaz. The effects of poverty among the laboring class heightened during the Diaz administration. All the while, a growing number of Mexican laws protected foreign investors who owned vast sections of land. The peasants who worked the land had no hope of private property ownership. In the U.S., the stability of the Mexican government would likely see continued foreign trade and commerce between the two countries. This was the primary political agenda by U.S. policymakers. U.S. interests regarding the popular revolts centered on monitoring its progress and supporting a Mexican government that would support and continue commercial interests. How the Mexican government treated their own population was deemed an internal situation to be resolved only by the Mexican government itself. The U.S. presidents who would create a gradual move towards an expanded foreign policy would be Chester Arthur and Grover Cleveland. Treaties for reasons of trade were made with Mexico and in South America. Political advisors suggested that treaties in which both countries would benefit would unite such nations while their cultural or political agendas might be different. However, the U.S. Congress was very reluctant to grant concessions or reduce import duties as this was a source of re federal revenue. By the late 1880s, the slow drive for expansionism and expansionist policies continued to be debated under the Benjamin Harrison administration. As the U.S. pushed to become a world power, foreign affairs often played a central role. National leaders debated on how best to respond to increasing commercial competition. And access to raw materials, of course, is included in this. Amidst the international power and presence of Europeans around the world as rivals. All the while, nationalism caught the hearts and minds of colonial peoples. Such was the case for colonies of the Spanish Empire by the 1890s. By 1895, Cubans rebelled against colonial rule. This was a dangerous and close to home foreign policy issue. The U.S. economy depended on their imports from Cuba for sugar. With increased import duties placed on them by the United States, the uprising led to an armed revolt. The political message by the rebels evolved into ending colonial rule in Cuba so the people could rule themselves. Spanish troops released news items that were negative and these would be published by William Randolph Hearst in his New York Journal. News items in particular featured stories that included Cuban rebels rounded up and sent to camps. Concern about Cuba became a national issue and a significant element of foreign debates in Congress. President Cleveland advocated neutrality which appeased Spain. By the election year of 1896, the president was unpopular. This policy of non-interference continued for a few years until the sinking of the U.S. Maine in Havana Harbor. With the 1896 election, William McKinley was the president that was selected. He brought improved relations with the American press, along with an improved vision of the presidency and the office itself. 
He presented and passed bills to preserve domestic economic concerns as well, such as raising custom rates on imports. While Mahan argued that to be a great nation, its government needed to possess a strong navy. It was important to have territories to possess. Thus, governments, such as in the United States, that supported and sustained a mobile military presence, this element made all the difference in acquiring territories. In 1878, the United States obtained in the Pacific the harbor of Pago Pago in Samoa as a naval station. Later in 1887, Pearl Harbor in Hawaii for the same purpose. Six years later, American settlers, sugar plantation owners, and merchants deposed Queen Lilio Kalani in a political coup bringing down this internationally recognized independent sovereign state run by a monarchy. Prior to annexation, the Hawaiian Islands were recognized internationally. From 1875, the United States enjoyed a free trade agreement with Hawaii as sugar coming into the United States did not incur import duties. This economic perk encouraged more planting of sugar across the Hawaiian Islands, creating a significant U.S. presence there. During 1892, Queen Lilio Kalani and her advisors struggled over the presence and role of foreigners in the country. In this same year, in a dictator-like fashion, the Queen dismissed her political advisors and created a constitution that nullified the powers formerly held by white settlers. American advocates who argued to annex Hawaii only fanned the flames of an international revolt causing civil disorder. Acts of American diplomacy and the Navy were called into action. The course of events that transpired created a political coup in which, with the help of 150 American Marines, the Queen gave in and a provisional government was set into place. With this pro-white settler government, after the revolt established, the United States agreed to a treaty of annexation in 1893. It was obvious the growth of the American military and the Navy played a keen role in creating a political power play in which Queen Lilio Kalani could not match. It is important to remember the United States was not alone in regards to interests in the Pacific. Both Germany and Great Britain remained U.S. competitors for islands in this area. Canada and the United States, former British colonies and heritage, have become manufacturing centers, created powerful corporations, and banking arose. North America stands as a stark contrast as compared with the balance of the American continent that have continued to this day primarily as extractive and agricultural nations. Extractive economies, past and present, grow, mine, and or harvest natural resources. The range is immense. Imported to industrial countries, raw materials top the list, with wheat, melons, and beef, to lumber and tropical fruits and vegetables. Sadly, the illegal trade of tropical drug products desired by consumers in industrial nations continues to the present day. With the financial support of Western banks, 
Latin American countries became increasingly dependent on foreign investment to build railroads and harbors. Once this type of infrastructure was complete, this enabled areas from Latin America to India to the Philippines to ship desired raw materials to Western buyers thus engaging in an active international trade economy. For the new imperialists, their goals were shortened transportation routes, opening new markets for manufactured goods, and taming the wilderness. The building of the Panama Canal and its final opening by 1914 met all of these aims. Purchase from a French engineering firm by the U.S. government, a political coup was encouraged and supported by Theodore Roosevelt. This led to giving Panama its independence and also U.S. rights to build the canal. It opened on August 15, 1914, after 10 years of construction. The new canal cut off 8,000 miles of sea travel between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Thus, cost and time greatly reduced in shipping goods.